So, uh, so this was the topic I was asked to address, and, and I, uh, I love to talk about uh, research in the field, and, and I wish uh, we were a little further along than we are, but I think there still are a lot of exciting developments that I want to share with you. And um, I want to start out by, by just uh, reminding you what you learned in grade school, that there's a difference between facts and opinions, right? So, so some things are facts and some things are opinions. And when you hear about Alzheimer's disease, whether it's in the media or whether it's in prestigious medical journals, uh, a lot of opinions uh, are often stated as if they were facts. And what I'm going to try to do uh, in the next uh, 40 minutes or so uh, is, is share with you a combination of facts and opinions, but try to make uh, as clear as I can what's a fact and what's an opinion and, and the distinguish between the two. Uh, I also understand that this is a diverse audience, um, so uh, I'm going to uh, start with some fairly fundamental things, and I apologize for some of you that might have uh, very higher levels of training, but we'll get to, to the more complicated things uh, later on, and I hope this will appeal to everyone. So, so for starters, you know, what do we know about Alzheimer's disease? And, and one of the things that we know is that the, the brain of a patient with Alzheimer's disease is characterized by something that's called amyloid plaques. Uh, and it was over 100 years ago that Dr. Alzheimer made this observation. He, he saw a patient in his practice who uh, was a middle-aged patient. She was in her 50s, and she had uh, both paranoia uh, and some memory problems. Uh, and uh, after many years passed, uh, she passed away, and he had the opportunity to examine her brain. And he saw some abnormalities in her brain that he thought were probably connected to the disease. And, and that's uh, what we started calling Alzheimer's disease. So that's Dr. Alzheimer right there. Uh, and this is a section of brain tissue that shows what Dr. Alzheimer saw under the microscope. This isn't that patient's brain, but it's the same idea. So you can see this uh, sort of mottled brown background. That's, that's healthy brain tissue. That's the way it looks in this preparation. But you see these blotches, they're sort of irregular blotches, and the brain is just peppered with them. That, that's what the plaques are. The, the, the plaques are these deposits of abnormal material that are laid down between the brain cells. And because they're between the cells, there are no sharp borders. It's just these blurry borders around them. And that's what the plaques are. And that's what Dr. Alzheimer noticed 100 years ago. And he speculated there was a connection between that abnormality uh, and the clinical changes that he saw in the patient. And that's the question that we're still struggling with. And I'm going to go into that in detail in a few minutes. So that's, that's a fact. You know, Alzheimer's brain is, is characterized by plaques in the brain. The Alzheimer's brain is also characterized by another abnormality that, that Dr. Alzheimer also saw. And you see, you see this uh, very dark uh, uh, thing here. This, this is also uh, a microscope image from a brain of a patient with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and this lesion is sometimes referred to as flame-shaped or teardrop-shaped. Uh, and this is a tangle, uh, and that's a little different from a plaque. It's a second lesion that's in the brain. Uh, and these tangles are actually inside of the neurons, so when you look at them under a microscope, they have very sharp borders. Uh, and they're, they're, they're distinct from the plaques, both in the shape, in, in the place, uh, and in their composition. Uh, and this will become important later on when we're talking about how, how we're trying to uh, tackle different aspects of all of But the point for, for now is that the brain is characterized by plaques, uh, amyloid plaques and by tangles. Uh, the brain in Alzheimer's disease also shrinks. Uh, we know that. Uh, we've known that for a long time. You can actually see this to some extent uh, on MRI scans. You can see the brain shrink uh, over time. Uh, uh, it's not impressive enough that you can really make a diagnosis based on the MRI scan alone, but there's enough shrinkage that it's actually detectable with some of the imaging studies we already have. So on the left is a plump, full brain of a patient who died of, of some other disease. And on the right is, is sort of this shrunken brain. You can see the spaces at the surface are larger, and the overall brain is smaller because it's actually loss of brain tissue, ultimately death of cells, nerve cells in the brain. Now, um, the, the death of the nerve cells in the brain is not entirely indiscriminate. It's, it's pretty widespread, as you can see from the picture. There's a lot of tissue loss in the brain. But some of the brain cells are more sensitive to the degenerative process than others. And you, you probably all know that the brain works uh, on the basis of chemicals in the brain, neurotransmitters. You've heard of serotonin in depression and, and dopamine in, in Parkinson's disease and that sort of thing. In, in Alzheimer's disease, uh, the cells that are particularly sensitive to the degenerative process, one of the groups of cells, uh, is a group of cells that makes a brain chemical called acetylcholine. Uh, and this is a cartoon uh, explaining uh, how the, the cholinergic cells uh, uh, in the brain uh, are arranged. 
So this is, the, this is a side view of the entire brain. So the nose is up here, and the back of the head is over here. Uh, and the point it's making is that all the cells that make this particular chemical are planted at the base of the brain. It's called the basal forebrain. That's the end. Uh, they're planted at the base of the brain, and they have these branches going out to all the cortical areas. The cerebral cortex is where all your thinking goes on. Uh, and this one set of cells has these very long branches that sort of sprinkle <coughs> the acetylcholine in the thinking parts of the brain. That, that's how it works when people are healthy. You can think of it as, as the trunk of a tree planted here, and there's branches literally going out to all these areas, sprinkling the acetylcholine. And in, when, when people have Alzheimer's disease, in addition to the plaques and the tangles and the shrinkage of the brain, this uh, center, this, this set of neurons just shrivels up. It just, the, the branches uh, uh, wither. Uh, and let, fewer and fewer of those branches are getting to the cortex, so there's less of this neurotransmitter making it to the cortex. And that's important uh, in terms of the, the treatment strategies that have been developed so far. Uh, and those, those treatment strategies uh, have more fruit in that there are four drugs that have been FDA approved for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. And, and I'm guessing that this crowd is probably familiar with most of these names. The brand names are Aricept, Exelon, Grazidine, and um, uh, Namenda. <coughs> and then the generic names are also uh, listed here as well. So these are drugs that are already FDA approved, and three of those drugs uh, actually work on that system that I was just describing to you. They work on this cholinergic system, the, the cells that make acetylcholine. They help the cells basically deliver more acetylcholine to the cortex. They're, they're drugs that boost levels of, of that particular neurotransmitter uh, in, the, in the learning uh, centers of the brain, the thinking centers uh, of the brain. And uh, the fourth one actually works on a different neurochemical, and I'm not going to go into that in, in too much detail, but all these drugs have been approved uh, by the FDA because they have shown some degree of efficacy uh, in double-blind, placebo-controlled trials. So it's, it's a fairly high bar to get FDA approval. Uh, and these drugs are, are not, uh, as most of you know, they're not as good as we'd like them to be. They really don't change the long-term outcome of the disease. But to get them approved really is um, uh, an arduous process and a, a demanding process. And in fact, it's been more than a decade since anything has been approved. Uh, the vendor was the last one. It's more than 10 years ago now. Now, uh, we also know that these drugs, again, are working on neurotransmitters. They're tweaking the chemistry of the brain a little bit. Uh, and they really don't have an effect on the other processes that I described to you. None of the, they don't work on the plaques. They don't work on the tangles. They don't work on the uh, death of the brain cells. They, they work at, at sort of the tip of the iceberg. They work at boosting up uh, a neurotransmitter. So, so you might even wonder why we would prescribe them uh, at all. And, and here's the answer right here. It's because the pharmaceutical representatives are so attractive. <laughs> So, so, so we prescribe them because they, they help the sick brain work a little bit better. Um, and uh, uh, this is obviously uh, a joke. And, uh, I guess it's not a uh, So I wanted to just show you uh, a figure that, that gives you a sense of how these drugs work. And it shows both uh, the fact that they do something and the limitations of these drugs. And, and we have to appreciate it in both of them. So uh, we'll look at this, this figure for starters. So, so this, this is a relatively recent study, but it, it's consistent with what we've seen in a lot of other studies. And I thought it was a nice way to uh, get a sense of this at a glance. So uh, in this um, uh, particular scale, uh, going up is bad. Okay, Lower on the scale is, is better. Uh, and uh, what it compares is people who are on placebo, people who are on one drug, people who are on the other drug, and people who are on a combination of drugs. Okay. And you can see that there's a separation from those groups. And this was a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial. This is sort of the gold standard for comparing these, these medicines. Uh, and we did see a group separation, but it's, it's really a modest difference uh, in, in the treated people compared to the untreated people. And, and the other thing that's, that's evident that I, I, I want to really emphasize is that if, if these drugs were actually, for example, slowing the rate of neuron death, or were actually changing the progression of the disease, there should be not just a separation between the groups, but the rate of progression should be different. The slope should be different between these. 
Uh, and in this study, as is seen in almost every study of these drugs, we're not really seeing a change in the slope. Okay? Is that so, so I think this is a very confusing issue for, for people that, that, that these drugs are, are having a beneficial effect on symptoms. They really are doing something, but they're not changing the course of the disease, the long-term course of the disease. Now, at any given point in time, the brain is working a little bit better on the drugs than, than, than without the drugs. So the way that I describe this to my patients is that they're, they're making a sick brain work a little bit better. They're not preventing the brain from getting further damage over time, but they're making a sick brain work a little bit better. So, so that's uh, really where we stand in terms of, of approved uh, drugs. Uh, and, and again, you'll hear a lot of the, you've probably already heard a lot of debate about this. Some people think these drugs, everybody with a diagnosis needs to be on them. Some people at the other end of the spectrum think the drugs are completely useless. And I think the facts are, as I just described, they, they, they do something, but they don't do as much as, as we would like. So, so when, you, when you think to yourself, well, why do the drugs you know, work at all? And they, they work because they're correcting a chemical abnormality that is a fact in the brain. That's something that we really know is occurring in the brain. So they're really hitting a, a potential therapeutic target. Well, why don't they work better? And it's because they, they don't cover all those other things. They don't have an effect on the plaques. They don't have an effect on the tangles. They don't have an effect on the tangles. So it's, it's these other aspects of the disease that, that the research world is working on right now. We're trying to figure out other ways to fundamentally change the course of the disease, to actually modify the course, to actually protect the brain uh, all the time. And that's what I want to turn to next. Uh, so when I, when I turn to this next topic, we're going to get away from uh, facts for a moment, and we're going to talk about what is essentially an opinion. So there is an opinion that the, the stuff that is in the plaques the, the plaques are made primarily of, of a substance called amyloid, A-M-Y-L-O-I-D. Uh, and there's an opinion <clears throat> that the stuff that's in the plaques is toxic to the brain, that it actually acts as a, uh, as a, as a toxin and drives the whole disease process. And this idea is called the amyloid hypothesis. And this opinion is that this stuff that's in the plaques is somehow toxic to the brain, is causing damage and ultimately death of the neurons. Okay. So this is an opinion, it's a pretty simple idea that the stuff here is causing neuronal damage uh, and death. Uh, but this opinion has really received a great deal of attention from the scientific community uh, and has generated a great many other facts, and that's what the upper part of the diagram uh, is. So uh, not long ago, all we knew was that if you, if you stain brain tissue from, from a patient with Alzheimer's disease, you could see the plaques. And what's been learned since then is, is exactly what the plaques are composed of, uh, that they're composed of this uh, stuff. Um, this is amyloid. A, A, beta is, is uh, amyloid. That it, it uh, uh, is a, a short, it's a peptide as it turns out. It's derived from a much longer precursor protein. That gene has been sequenced. The enzymes that cleave the, the, the original gene product have been identified and by enzymes, I mean molecular scissors. They basically take this long gene product and clip it in a certain way and, and generate this. The way that this stuff aggregates so it, it becomes toxic has all been sorted out. So the efforts uh, in the field have really, uh, to date, um, uh, uncovered a lot of the basic facts about how amyloid is generated. And they have also generated for us uh, a number of different sites in this pathway that we might try to attack with uh, therapeutic strategies. So for example, <clears throat> these enzymes up here that are responsible for, for snipping uh, the original product to make the, the stuff that eventually causes the trouble, uh, uh, inhibitors have been developed for these particular markers and, and have come into play. <clears throat> uh, drugs have been developed that prevent beta amyloid from aggregating. And, and they, they've been tested in test tubes and then in animal models and come into clinical trials. Uh, and then there's also an opinion that uh, maybe we can accelerate the removal of the beta amyloid by, by some method or other, and I'm going to go into that uh, in some detail. So again, the, the idea here is, and, and this again is an opinion, the idea is that amyloid is the culprit in the disease, and if we could do something about amyloid, then we could fundamentally change the, the course of the disease. Now, now, something that I, I didn't say to you uh, um, is that you know, amyloid, you know, once it's in the plaques and once it's in this form, is really uh, densely uh, aggregated. And, and in a test tube, 
we have to use concentrated acid to even get it into solution so we can measure it. I mean, it's, it's really tough stuff. Uh, and, and it's really hard to believe that anything would help to get the amyloid out of the brain. Uh, it's really, I think a few years ago, we would have thought that that, that aspect was almost an impossible task to actually get blue amyloid in the brain. But there's, there's been a, a series of studies that have focused on this idea of removing amyloid uh, from the brain. Uh, and they, they've actually uh, focused on using the patient's own immune system to remove the amyloid from the brain. And that's what I want to describe to you in the next uh, few slides. So this, this started uh, with experiments uh, in, in animals. Mice can be genetically engineered to get plaques in the brain. Mice actually don't get Alzheimer's disease on their own. But they can be genetically engineered so they get plaques in their brain. And, and these pictures, on the, this on the left, this is a microscope picture of a brain from a mouse that's been engineered to get Alzheimer's disease. And everything that's dark brown is a plaque, and some of the plaques are actually running together. So you can see it in this animal model, uh, they have plenty of, of plaques in the brain. Uh, and in this experiment, which was done in the summer of, of 1999, or reported in the summer of 1999, uh, the, the immune system of the animals was triggered uh, so that the animals would make antibodies uh, directed against the plaques. Uh, and, and to tell you the truth, it was kind of a crazy idea. I, I, I don't know that I would have uh, endorsed this if I was reviewing the grant or the proposal. But it, it turns out that it works spectacularly well. So what you're seeing on the right is, this is the same, this is brain tissue from one of these mouse's uh, brothers or sisters who had been um, uh, stimulated so that they made antibodies directed against amyloid. And they, that amyloid in their brain has been completely wiped out. It, it, it's, it, is, it remains the most dramatic effect that has ever been seen in these animal models. That the immune system can really have a whopping effect on the uh, amount of amyloid uh, in the brain. Now this uh, actually went into human studies. Uh, and uh, I'm going to tell you the, the good part of the human studies next, and then, uh, and then I'll, I'll tell you about some of the not so uh, good parts. So uh, in, this, in this human study, people uh, with Alzheimer's disease also were stimulated to generate antibodies directed against amyloid. Uh, and it was a placebo-controlled trial, so some people got the vaccine and some people got placebo. Uh, and, and the trial lasted for uh, a little over a year. But as years went by, some of these patients died of, of other causes, and their brains were examined at autopsy. Uh, and some of those brains uh, actually showed far less amyloid uh, than, than was expected. And the people who, who were uh, getting placebo uh, had as much amyloid as, as they would have been expected to have otherwise. So, so this was a very um, uh, compelling uh, uh, suggestion that this strategy that has uh, been developed in animals could actually work. Uh, in human beings. Uh, now, the, the not so good news is that there was also a bad side effect of this, this particular approach, and the study had to be aborted. So, so people had uh, excessive inflammation in their brain, and, and the study had to be aborted for that reason. But um, uh, other approaches uh, harnessing the immune system to remove amyloid have, have since been uh, developed, and the idea has been uh, resuscitated, as I'll describe in the next few slides. Now, the, the, the demonstration here uh, that, that this uh, uh, agent had an effect uh, is, I think, compelling when you just compare the, the couple of pictures. But if you think about it, this was a study with hundreds of people uh, and, and waiting for, for brain autopsies. It requires you to wait for a really long time to, to find out what, what the answer is. It would be preferable, of course, if we could somehow monitor amyloid levels in the brains of human beings. And when this particular trial was, was launched, that wasn't available, but, but things have changed dramatically in that regard, and that's what the next couple of slides are about. So there are now PET scans, uh, which allow us to see whether somebody has amyloid uh, in their brain or not. And these are pictures from, from one of these PET scans. And uh, the, the colors on PET scans are set so that the colors that intuitively feel warm to you are the, the colors that are hot on the PET scan. Uh, and, and this is a, a special type of PET scan that is showing uh, amyloid uh, in the brain. And you can see in the patient with Alzheimer's disease, it's a hot-looking scan because there's a lot of amyloid. Uh, whereas in the control subject, uh, it's a very cold-looking scan because there's no amyloid there. Uh, and in the intermediate uh, people, people who uh, are, are what we call mild cognitive impairment, some of them have hot scans and some of them have cold scans. But, but this is a development that's just come around over the last uh, uh, decade. 
Uh, you've heard of PET scans before. PET scans have been available for a long time, uh, but the PET scans that have been available uh, so far uh, have been represented by these. these so, so these are the PET scans that were available for many years, and it's a PET scan looking at rates of metabolism. And this is a patient with Alzheimer's disease, and this is a controlled patient. This is a patient without Alzheimer's disease. And you can see there are some subtle differences there, uh, and, and in real life, the differences are even more subtle. So, so people have tried to use these scans to make a diagnosis, but these scans are really not looking directly at the pathology, uh, and the difference between Alzheimer's and controls is really quite subtle. Uh, this new scan <coughs> is shown here. So this new scan is showing you just where the amyloid is, the, the stuff that's in the plaques. It's showing just amyloid. Uh, and here it's black and white uh, between the Alzheimer's patient and a, and a real healthy control subject. One has a lot of amyloid, one has none. So, so that's a real um, uh, big advantage. This first version of the scan was called PIB, uh, Pittsburgh Compound B. Uh, that particular version of the PET scan uh, just was not suitable for widespread use. Uh, the stuff couldn't, it didn't travel well, so it couldn't be sent to other sites. Uh, but now there are other alternatives that have become available, uh, and we've been able to actually use this uh, at OHSU. This is an example of some scans from OHSU with cold looking scans at the top from a control subject and a hot looking scan at the bottom from a patient with Alzheimer's disease. So, this is really a reality now that we can image uh, amyloid in living patients. This is a big deal. Uh, particularly for clinical trials, because now it becomes possible to administer a drug and see whether they actually have an effect on, on amyloid uh, in the brain over time. Uh, and in the most recent versions of immunotherapy, uh, this has been tried. So in, in the more recent versions of immunotherapy, instead of asking the patient to make, to, to mount their own antibodies, to make their own antibodies directly against amyloid, instead of stimulating their immune system, we actually make the antibody and give the antibody to the patient. And, and the reason that that's preferable is it's a more controlled uh, uh, way of, of uh, uh, manipulating the immune system. And if there are any complications, we can just stop giving the antibody and then the reaction is over. Whereas the old way of stimulating the immune system would start a process that we couldn't necessarily control. So in these studies that have used uh, uh, antibodies uh, directed against uh, amyloid, uh, 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 this process of imaging the brain in living patients over time has been employed. Uh, and what we've seen in the first reported study is that people who got placebo uh, had this modest accumulation of amyloid over time, whereas the people getting the antibody uh, had a stabilization and then a decline. <laughs> So this is a very um, big deal, and, and I think a real surprise. As I said a few minutes ago, in a test tube, removing the amyloid from brain tissue is very, very hard. And to think that it can be achieved in living uh, patients is, is really uh, quite spectacular. So, so this has been a real uh, advance that's been reported uh, just in the last couple of years. Now, as with the first study, unfortunately, all the news uh, isn't good. And uh, this study, which was done in people who had the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, they had mild early Alzheimer's disease. This effect on the amyloid in the brain was documented uh, with great certainty, but the patients were no better off. They continued to decline and, and deteriorate. So, so it was uh, a very um, uh, discouraging uh, uh, result in some respects. The, the scientific part that I just described to you, again, is spectacular. Uh, this is a very important development, but uh, the, the fact that the patients didn't fare any better uh, was, a, was a great disappointment. So, so again, these are facts that I'm giving you, and now I'm shifting to opinions, right? So, so the opinions are, how do we interpret this finding as to uh, the fact that removing amyloid from the brain is possible, but didn't have a clinical effect in these patients? Well, one opinion <coughs> is that the treatment was just started too late. That if, if you start this treatment and people already have Alzheimer's disease, maybe it's just too late to, to really have an impact on the process. And maybe if we start these treatments earlier in people who, who had uh, sort of a, uh, a precursor of Alzheimer's disease or people who, who we knew were at high risk uh, but didn't have Alzheimer's disease yet, maybe we'd have a better chance of, of achieving a clinical benefit. So, so that's plausible, but it is an opinion. Uh, now, that opinion is being tested as we speak. There are trials all over the country and all over the world <laughs> testing that possibility, including some trials uh, we're participating in uh, at OHSU. Uh, 
So that's one opinion about this. The other opinion is that, that we're just barking up the wrong tree uh, going after amyloid. That, that maybe amyloid is not the right therapeutic target. It certainly is not the only thing that's going on in the brain. I mean, this is a series of different things. And uh, this uh, possibility is also uh, very plausible. And this possibility is also being tested out. So uh, I want to spend the next few minutes talking about <clears throat> some of the other uh, candidate targets uh, and, and giving you a sense of, of what's uh, on your way there. So the first one uh, I mentioned in the beginning when I talked about the different processes in the brain. So this, this tangle, this neurofibrillary tangle, this is a, a lesion that is distinct from, from the plaque. And, and there's a, a camp of uh, scientists who've been arguing for a long time that maybe this is what we should be targeting to begin with. Maybe this is really the, the damage to the brain that needs to be mitigated and, and needs to be uh, focused on. Uh, the, the plaque, as I said, is composed of something called amyloid. Uh, the tangle uh, is composed of a different substance that's called tau, T-A-U. And uh, what we know about tau is that here is a healthy neuron, uh, and you know neurons are like uh, electrical wires, right? So here's a wire coming out at you with all the, the um, uh, uh, different part, uh, you know, uh, fibers in the wire uh, pointing out at you. And uh, inside uh, of this process, uh, there are these very small proteins that are the tau protein, and they sort of stabilize the wire. They, they stabilize the tubes inside. Uh, and somehow in Alzheimer's disease, that stabilizing protein goes awry, and it clumps up, uh, and it clusters, and then it fills up the neuron, and, and that is, is, the, is the tangle. And, and that's actually a fact. We know that that's, that's part of what goes on in Alzheimer's uh, and this is an opinion, even though it's, it's stated as if it's a fact, but, but the opinion of this group of people is that if, if we were to uh, somehow deal more effectively with the abnormal forms of tau, uh, we could change the outcome of the disease. So um, uh, again, tau has a, has a normal function stabilizing the, the, the fibers uh, of the brain. Uh, tau can clump, uh, and we can figure out a way to um, uh, interfere with that clumping, clustering process, uh, we can make a difference in the disease. Now, there is uh, uh, a drug uh, that has been tested in, in, um, in test tubes, uh, in cells, uh, and in animals, uh, which has the desirable effect. It keeps the, the tau from uh, aggregating, from clumping, and causing problems. Uh, and the drug, uh, the, the generic name is methylene blue. How many people have heard of Rember? It was in the news a couple of years ago. Anybody heard of that one? It's kind of funny because these things. Um, Waves. But, so this is one example of an experimental drug that is, is uh, trying to be developed for Alzheimer's disease, and it's targeting something distinct from amyloid. It's targeting the tau molecule, uh, and it's one of several different therapies that are, are called uh, considered anti-tau therapies. Uh, and this is a whole new line of investigation that you're going to hear more and more about, and uh, uh, hopefully will give us uh, either an alternative or a complement to the anti-amyloid therapies that I've so that's one potential therapeutic target. Another one uh, has to do with uh, insulin uh, signaling in the brain. So uh, I, I suspect uh, everyone knows that insulin has something to do with diabetes. Now it turns out that the brain also needs insulin. Like any other organ, the brain needs insulin. Uh, and the brain really needs glucose probably more than, than other organs. So the brain is particularly uh, uh, dependent on insulin signaling. It's also true that people who have diabetes have an increased incidence of Alzheimer's disease. And we don't quite know the whole mechanistic pathway uh, 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 explaining that, but we do know that that's a fact. Diabetics have an increased incidence of Alzheimer's disease. We also know um, that patients with Alzheimer's disease have an increased incidence of, of diabetes, or at least of glucose insensitivity. So it, it, it seems to work the other way as well. So there's some kind of a relationship between um, uh, insulin and diabetes and, and Alzheimer's disease that has been an area of interest for some time. Uh, and uh, some scientists, uh, primarily at the University of Washington, uh, have put together a, a pretty strong case that, that the brain in patients with Alzheimer's disease is actually resistant to insulin. 
the patient may not have overt diabetes. It might not be that all their organs are resistant to insulin, but the brain seems to be relatively resistant to insulin in Alzheimer's disease, according to this group of investigators. And if, if that's true, if that's an important part of the disease, then if we could just get more insulin to the brain, uh, if we can get it directly to the brain without causing the person's blood sugar to bottom out systemically, then, then maybe we could get the brain to, to work more effectively. But uh, it's been a conundrum about how to get insulin to the brain without affecting uh, the rest of the body. Uh, and the, the solution that has been proposed and, and tested to some extent uh, is to give the insulin uh, intranasal. Use like a like you use for Flonase or something else to deliver the insulin intranasal. And um, the, the the scientist who has developed this uh, is um, named Suzanne Kraft. She's at you know she was at the University of Washington. She's since moved to the East Coast. And she was at a big scientific meeting that I attended. Uh, where she was talking about uh, the rationale for this, and um, she she was always puzzled. She she tried this out on the basis of, of some science that there were some special pathways from the nose to the brain, um, but she didn't fully understand it. She's not an anatomist. So she asked her, her friend, who was the director of neuropathology at the University of Washington and really a world famous scientist and doctor, she said, how, how does this work? Can you tell me how, how you know, putting it in the nose gets it to the brain? And he said, well, Suzanne, the, the nose is really close to the brain. But the reality is, this has been tested uh, in, in a number of people uh, with or at risk of Alzheimer's disease, and it really does get to the brain, uh, and it really does not uh, affect uh, systemic uh, blood levels. Um, and this is an example of, of what uh, Dr. Kraft uh, has, has seen in some of these studies. This is a, uh, a functional MRI study that's showing you patterns of brain activation, uh, and this, this patient has, uh, with, with uh, pre-Alzheimer's disease, uh, has received placebo, and you can see the, the pattern of brain activation here, and when the insulin is delivered, it's not only getting to the brain, but it's having an effect on the activation patterns of the brain. Uh, and it also had some effect on some of the cognitive uh, functions uh, in the brain. So, so this idea, uh, which I think a few years ago um, was, was a little bit on the margins, has now really moved to the center uh, of thinking. This is, uh, we don't fully understand how it might be related to amyloid and, and to tangles and to that sort of thing. But um, the scientific community has really uh, embraced the idea that this is another uh, uh, viable strategy for the uh, treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and uh, the opinion right now is that, that this approach may slow the progression of pre-Alzheimer's disease or even Alzheimer's itself. And a clinical trial has been drafted and funded. Uh, and if you heard a few months ago about uh, the, the president's national Alzheimer's I mean, this is a big deal. This is where the federal government is really uh, uh, staking their, their claim to what they think is going to work. This trial is part of the National uh, Alzheimer's Plan. So the study is uh, due to start uh, this fall uh, and uh, we'll be participating at OHSU. It will actually be a national multi-center trial and um, uh, we're very uh, hopeful about it. So uh, I want to talk about one other uh, uh, potential target and that is uh, the blood vessels in the brain. And uh, this uh, picture that you're looking at is from a, a monograph that came from the Centers for Disease Control, so a federal agency, uh, in combination with the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, and the, the thrust of the entire monograph was really that all the things that we know are bad for the heart turn out to be bad for the brain. That, 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 that everything we know about blood pressure and cholesterol and, and blood sugar uh, and, and so on uh, has as much of an effect on the brain as it has on the heart. So all the things that we all, at this point, almost intuitively know about keeping the heart healthy are important for keeping the brain uh, healthy uh, as well. And uh, there's a number of different uh, examples of, of the validity of this idea from the medical literature. And this is just one example where they were uh, looking at a group of people who had uh, early Alzheimer's disease. So a lot of you are familiar with the MMSE. It's a 30-point scale. A bunch of people started out around uh, 22 on that scale. This was a few hundred people. Uh, and in this study, they were able to uh, compare people who had, uh, uh, all the people in the study had some degree of vascular risk factors. So vascular risk factors are high blood pressure, uh, high cholesterol, smoking, uh, and uh, uh, high blood sugar. Uh, and in the people who, who didn't have um, uh, any of those things treated, uh, they went down to the fastest. 
The people who had some of their vascular risk factors treated uh, were sort of in the middle. And the people who had most of them remained uh, much more stable than the others. So it's, it, this is just one example of many uh, examples from the literature making the case that even though um, Alzheimer's disease is not thought to uh, be involved in the blood vessels per se, keeping the brain healthy in other respects can really change the outcome of uh, people who are uh, at risk or, or who have Alzheimer's disease. So it reiterates the importance of treating these vascular risk factors. We should treat them anyway, but, but if, if you're particularly worried about your brain, maybe this is another way to motivate um, uh, your patients or your family members or, or yourselves to, to treat those things. So uh, along these lines, um, uh, at OHSU, uh, uh, there was a study that was published uh, about a year ago now, uh, where in, uh, uh, Dr. Bowman was examining the effects of different nutri uh, nutrients uh, on both cognitive function, thinking functions uh, in, in elderly patients, but also MRI markers of the, the health of the brain, and in particular, MRI markers of the health of small blood vessels in the brain. Now this is a little bit of an oversimplification, but this, this MRI marker, which is represented on this up and down axis on this graph, this is an MRI marker indicating uh, how uh, healthy the, blood, the, the brain vessels are. It's called white matter hyperintensities. Uh, and the higher you are on this, um, uh, the worse uh, your, your uh, uh, white matter, uh, uh, excuse me, the worse the health of your small blood vessels in your brain. Uh, and what uh, Dr. Bowman observed in this study was that uh, people who had the, the, the most uh, white matter hyperintensity, the, the sickest uh, looking brain in terms of blood vessels, had the lowest levels of omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, and the people who had the highest levels of omega-3 fatty acids had lower levels of this marker. And that was true uh, for, for both of the, the two key uh, omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, and this, this finding, um, I'm highlighting this one because it came from the you. But this is actually not the only instance uh, of this observation. The, the Framingham study has observed it, cardiovascular health studies observed it. So it's, it's really a very reproducible finding. Uh, and that uh, has led to this idea that uh, uh, low omega-3 fatty acids in the blood uh, may uh, lead to sick blood vessels, with sick blood vessels actually leading to, uh, to dementia or to increased expression. So uh, Dr. Bowman has uh, submitted uh, a grant to the uh, National Institute of Health, uh, and it's, it's very likely to be funded. Uh, it was scored uh, better than 97% of all the grants uh, submitted in that ground, so um, hopefully it's going to be funded, and we'll be uh, conducting that study before uh, too long. So it looks like I'm a little bit ahead of schedule, but I, I wanted to summarize uh, by, by making the point that I, I think our current state of knowledge uh, uh, with respect to Alzheimer's disease can be summarized in a few points. We, we do have some approved drugs which target some specific uh, neurotransmitters, and those drugs can help a little. Okay. Uh, we also know uh, now that we can image uh, amyloid in living patients, and that's, that's a brand new uh, ability. Uh, so that's a, a real advance and a step in the right direction. It's going to really accelerate uh, the development of clinical therapies. We also know that we can uh, modify the amount of amyloid in the, in the brains of living patients. So, so that's a very big advance, as, as I've uh, uh, tried to emphasize. Uh, uh, but it may be that amyloid is not the right target. Uh, and we do need to be thinking about some other targets other than amyloid. Uh, and as I've described in the, in the latter part of the talk, there are other targets that are being uh, uh, evaluated and, and uh, we're developing clinical trials uh, for these as well. So those, those are the facts. I think those are some of the facts. Uh, one of the other things that is, is clearly a fact is that uh, uh, conducting clinical trials is, is really important for advancing uh, the disease, uh, or advancing the understanding of the disease and advancing uh, therapy. Uh, uh, getting people into these trials is really the biggest bottleneck. Uh, in industry, people know this, and the NIH people know Getting people into the clinical trials is our biggest hurdle to, to really advancing uh, science. So we really need volunteers for these studies to, to test these ideas out. Uh, and if you're interested, uh, you can call our place. Uh, Lisa Lurie is uh, sitting here and also has a, a, a booth out front, uh, and um, we can give you more information about how to get people uh, referred for studies. So I'm going to uh, conclude there, and I don't know if you want me to take questions now or you want to keep moving here. Um, we have a couple of group up minutes for questions, okay. since we were uh, really good about that. So, and I think we have a microphone. Oh, yes. Well, you can. <laughs> 
Um, you mentioned in your uh, PowerPoint that uh, people with um, or vascular um, disease causes um, dementia. Um, if, if it's treated with um, antihypertensives, the cholesterol that's treated, I see it, people with vascular dementia also put on like Aricept, um, Nemenda. Why is that so since the root cause would be vascular disease, not family? Okay, so, so, why we, so if somebody has a dementia that's, that's due to vascular disease rather than Alzheimer's disease, why would those drugs be tried? Yes. And um, the, the main reason is that a lot of those people have mixed disease. They have more than one process in place. Uh, and, and actually, uh, if you look at the brains of people that are thought to have vascular dementia, a lot of them also have amyloid in the brain. So it's, it's not unusual for us to try these drugs and see if we get a therapeutic response, even though we're not convinced it's kind of mm -hmm. well, What's the percentage that you see in the practice that's vascular, or the mix? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think um, most of the patients have a mix. Uh, we don't say that, but I think that's the reality. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's drilled into you from day one in medicine that you make one diagnosis, right? You, you zero all the signs and symptoms down to a single diagnosis, but that rule just doesn't apply in geriatrics, right? So, so we, have, we have older people, they often have more than one pathology. So, so I think a lot of people uh, that we see, and the older they get, the more likely this is, uh, a lot of people have a combination of those different pathologies. But we still try to put them in one bin just for practical purposes. We try to give them one label for practical purposes, but I think uh, one of the things we're learning as we do more and more brain autopsies is that mixed pathology is very, very common. So, what is the impact of these treatments on low body dementia? Yeah, so that, that's a very good question, and, and the answer is we, we just don't know. And there, there haven't been any real formal studies of any of these therapies on, on low body dementia. You know, it stands to reason that good vascular risk factor control would make sense for low body just like it would for, for the other dementias. It's also true that most of the patients with Lewy body dementia also have some amount of amyloid uh, in their brain, but uh, these these uh, strategies have not been tested in that population per se. And, and actually, let me, let me just expand on that answer for one second. So I'm talking about the experimental strategies, the cholinesterase inhibitors, Aricept, Exelon, and those. But those are effective in the Lewy body dementia. And some people think they're even more effective in that group than in the original group. But again, it's a symptomatic effect and doesn't, doesn't change the long Thank you, Dr. Quinn. Um, can you tell me the tau-targeted clinical trial? Is that FDA-approved clinical study? Yeah. So, so the... Um, so FDA approval is, is separate. So if the FDA approves the is it randomized? Uh, yeah, the, 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 the plans for that trial are for a randomized trial. We're not conducting that particular one. That was just an example of, of uh, uh, a trial targeting tau. The headquarters for that trial is actually in England. Uh, and I'm not sure what the sites are going to be in the United States. But if anybody's interested uh, uh, in these sorts of questions for, for um, uh, clients or family members or what have you. There's a couple of places to look for the information. Probably the most convenient one is uh, clinicaltrials.gov, www.clinicaltrials.gov. You punch in the, the disease name and you can put in your zip code and you can find out what, what studies are being conducted uh, in your area. Is OHSU willing to collaborate with U of Dub? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, so, you know, let me expand. So, why do you ask that question? It's a payment issue. It's a payment issue? Okay. Um, so, 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 I'm going to go in a different direction. Because I get, in my audience, they get questions a lot of times. You know, are you people working together? Everyone has this idea, I think, from movies and TV that we're all hunkered down and keeping things secret. But, but really, there was a tremendous amount of collaboration. And every clinical trial uh, uh, of any magnitude is a multi-center trial. It's, it's going on nationally. We all work together. We have quarterly meetings of, of the, uh, uh, experts around the country. Uh, information is, now industry is different, but in, in academia, information is shared pretty freely, and there's really a tremendous amount of cooperation. And I think that's a, a misconception on the part of the public. We really do work together quite a bit. 
And when it comes to the UW, I mean, we, we have very close relationships with them. And in fact, I uh, have a lot of um, uh, cooperative arrangements where we share things back and forth. So, so uh, that's true both in Alzheimer's disease and in Parkinson's disease and, and other areas. Thank you. Um, so, oh, oh. one more. One more. Okay, next question. Uh, given, given the um, the importance placed on vascular health and as well as the immunotherapy approaches, are there any studies that you're aware of going on, including nutrition and collaboration with pharmacological interventions? Um, I'm I'm not aware of any um, collaborative studies okay. like that. Um, there are there are nutrition studies that are combining different nutrients together. Uh, including one at NOHSU that's combining omega-3 fatty acid with a nutrient that's called lipolic acid. Uh, there's also, there are also companies that are trying to put together what they call a cocktail. There's no alcohol involved, but a cocktail of, of vitamins uh, and supplements. Um, I can't think of an example of a, of a, of a drug that's being combined with, with nutrients. But or, or maybe separate, just nutrition alone, just maybe plant-based. You know, yeah, yeah, so there's lots of studies along those lines looking at, at nutrients and, and a lot of interest in that because it's um, so low risk and low cost and everything yeah. else. And there's Axona. Uh, uh, was the question what do I think of Axona? No, there is Axona. There, there is Axona. So Axona is a, is a medical food, right? Uh, and so that's a nutritional uh, approach. Um, and in the interest of time, I think that's all I'll say. <laughs> <laughs>